The Australasian Society of Building Biologists Environmental Health Conference and Expo 2018 will be held in Sydney on Saturday the 27th of October. Learn how buildings in which we live, study and work can affect our health from leading medical and environmental experts. For more information and to reserve your spot, please go to asbb.org.au. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today is Dr. Bradley McEwen. He's a nutrition expert, naturopath, educator and lecturer, researcher and mentor with over 19 years of clinical experience. Brad received his Doctor of Philosophy in Medicine from the University of Sydney, a Master of Health Science, Human Nutrition from Deakin University, amongst other qualifications. Brad has numerous original research and review articles published in peer-reviewed journals. He's also a peer reviewer for international journals. His special areas of interest include omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, antioxidants, chronic disease prevention and public health. He also enjoys chocolate. Welcome to FX Medicine, Brad. How are you? I'm very well, Andrew. How are you? I'm great, thanks. I haven't had chocolate today. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> Neither have I, but it's high from my list, though. Yeah. Is, there, list. is there a right time to eat chocolate for cardiometabolic protection? There's a question for later on. But you've described cardiometabolic syndrome as a multifactorial complex condition. And, of course, this sounds very serious. I guess we need to start off. What is cardiometabolic syndrome? Well, cardiometabolic syndrome is what we classify as a multifactorial complex condition, and that itself sounds quite complex. Um, One thing to note that all aspects of chronic disease are on the rise worldwide, and being a chronic disease, it has a greater impact and influence on the body system. Uh, I want you to think that cardiometabolic syndrome is a cluster of different health conditions altogether, and these include abdominal obesity as measured by waist circumference, elevated blood pressure, Um, high levels of triglycerides in the blood, low levels of um, HDL, so the good cholesterol in the blood, and also elevated um, fasting blood glucose levels. Other aspects involved are insulin resistance, where the body's not able to metabolize insulin effectively into the cells, chronic inflammation, increased oxidative stress. It can be classified as a prothrombotic state, which means you're at a higher risk of um, you know, heart attack and stroke. Yeah. And it, it is a major, major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, it's also in, encompasses other body systems like the, um, the liver. So it could be non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and particularly reproductive systems such as polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS, testosterone issues, erectile dysfunction in males, obstructive sleep apnea, and thyroid dysfunction. So it is quite a complex condition, and it pretty much covers all body systems, and this is one of my main specialties in clinical practice. Uh, I'd also like to note that um, out of the top 10 leading causes of death in Australia in 2016, um, quite a number of these, it's around about six, can be directly related to cardiometabolic syndrome, and another three have links. Yeah. So it's nearly half of all deaths in 2016 can be related to this health condition. Yeah, no matter what the diagnosis, it's related back to cardiometabolic issues. That's correct. Yeah. So just honing in on measurement a little bit. So, you know, we've got BMI was the age old thing and you're talking about waist circumference. There was also this measurement of wrist circumference and, and uh, there was a, a ratio. Is that right? There is. I don't know much about that. Um, it's, it's a relatively new marker. So what you'll find is that BMI, as noted, is quite a long-term marker, and they're now actually breaking it. World Health Organization is breaking it down into separate categories now, into not just obese and severely obese, but they're actually looking at Caucasian versus Asian backgrounds and European backgrounds, South American backgrounds. So it's actually becoming quite complex for the BMI. So what they're looking at now is a lot of other markers, such as risk circumference, I've also read some literature on ankle circumference as well related to edema or fluid retention leading to cardiovascular risk. Yeah. What about things like lean body mass? I I remember years ago there was a a sort of push towards um, looking at lean body mass 
lean body mass measurement. I investigated this with a company and they educated me on the the different types of basically the machines that they had. So that you had like a, I think it was a 12 channel lead that they used to use, you know, HIV wards uh, to calculate lean body mass in those patients so that they could calculate effective drug dose. But then there was a, a two channel machine, which was popularly used, but not nearly as sensitive. Do you know where we're headed there? Have we left it behind? Is it still appropriate? What's going on there? Um, the, these machines, or um, some of them are classified as bioimpedance analysis machines, yeah, yeah. Um, do measure quite a few points. And some of the ones you can get in like the retail environment do have two or four points of measurement. Um, the more um, detailed machines have the 12 points, 16 points, or minimum eight points. And what they're doing, they're measuring electrical impedance throughout the body, which then measures you know, fat mass, lean muscle mass, bone mineral density, fluid balance as well. And there is a lot of literature dating back decades showing that when you have a um, good level of lean body mass, you have a lesser risk of chronic disease, not just cardiovascular disease, but chronic diseases such as liver disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis as well. So it, it, is a, it is a good marker. And what I'd like to see in the future is a lot of these biomarkers made more readily available so people can actually track their symptoms. Mm. But also we can use them as a screening tool, maybe as um, maybe when you've changed the front digit of your age or something like that, you can go and have a test done. <laughs> it's a good time to do it as a memory tool. Um, that, that'd be something I'd be going for, but I'm a long way from the next one, so I'm happy to wait. <laughs> so what about the relevance of the 2-4 track versus the 12 track? I remember there were some concerns um, about the sensitivity of the information that we were getting. Is that relevant or are we just using it, since we're using it as a general screening, screening tool, that it's okay? I think uh, if we use it as a general screening tool, it's okay. If we just entirely rely on this device, that's where some of the faults could be. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, I've recently had the Commonwealth Games um, in Australia and quite a few of those athletes decided to use the you know, waist circumference, BMI, and other traditional markers, they'd be classified as overweight or obese. But when we look at them, they're actually very fit and healthy yeah. and quite muscular with their lean muscle mass. This is where the um, bioimpedance would come in and actually analyze that and give us more detail. And it's about grouping and piecing it all together. That's what makes a big difference. And one thing to note is the more channels, the better. It's more accurate. So the more accurate machines can measure you know, the lean muscle mass density of the right arm or right forearm versus the left one. And there's a lot of research coming out of Melbourne, particularly Deakin University, where they've done twin studies, where they've looked at, you know, both twins having the same genetic material, but one may be exercising and eating well, the other one may not. And they can actually compare, you know, the bone mineral density, lean muscle mass against the same genetic markers, right? so a genetic code. Um, and that's quite interesting research. But it's mm. also interesting in the um, the person itself because if you're a tennis player, for example, yeah. you're pretty much using the same arm all the time. So there's going to be a better or a higher bone mineral density and, lean, and muscle mass in one arm versus the other. There was one other point on on these uh, bioimpedance analysis machines that I, I have this dim, dark memory of. And that was one paper that I read, oh gosh, this has got to be a decade ago, um, that was looking at, uh, obese patients where it really didn't have any facility. It, it lost its sensitivity of, of picking up stuff because this patient was obese. Sometimes it's very clear exactly what we're looking for. And um, other cases, um, it's depending on the machine itself. It's, if it's a scale-type machine, these have a limited weight range. So if a person is obese and let's just say 120 kilos, the machine may have, um, or let's say 130 for this example, um, the machine may only be able to read accurately up to 120 kilograms. So therefore, anyone weighing more than that, it's yeah. not going to be as accurate. Yeah. But the um, other channels, you actually lay down on a um, particular, this is called table, and um, you get hooked up to all these electrodes, like this is a 12, 16 channel that, that you're thinking of as well. Mm. And you actually lay down and um, get hooked up to this machine similar to like an ECG type machine. And um, it has a wider range of capacity and therefore there's no weight on the scales affecting the um, sensitivity or accuracy of the test. So oh, I'm all for the um, utilisation of it. I think it's a good um, 
device to use in clinic. Uh, what about the function of lipids? The, the you know con- controversial of, of recent years um, because of the the statin. Uh, expose that came out and and then we're looking at um, functional versus non-functional lipids regardless of what you term is healthy or dangerous lipids. In other words, there are good bad fats and bad good fats. But then I've spoken to Ross Walker and he says, I don't really care. I care if it's causing disease. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> where do we go with this? <laughs> um, where do you find the the reasonable function of measuring lipids? I'm in the same boat as um, Dr. Ross Walker here, that um, you know anything that goes through the blood plays a role in the body. Yep. So some people see it as the, the river of life, so to say. So anything that goes through it, and if the blood is you know, really thick with um, lipids and other particles, for example, it's slow, it's more sluggish, it leads to infiltrates and atherosclerosis. It's just jumping ahead in time there, of course. But if it's more free-flowing with the right amount of lipids, coagulation factors, etc. It seems to be a more healthier blood, allowing nutrients to go to the tissue and to the cells and for the detoxification process to occur and for it to be sent back to the lymphatics out through the system as a, as a normal process. Um, I think over the past, we've focused too much, and this seems to be what happens every now and then, particularly um, with topics of interest. We focus on something very tightly for a period of time, and then we realise, oh, not exactly what we thought it was. So if you look at some of the long-term studies like Frangham, you know, Framingham Heart Disease, the um, Leon Heart Study, etc., these have been going since like 1948. And they've got the original people plus their children plus their children, for example. And they've had blood collected at various time points like every five years, 10 years, etc. And they're able to now measure for new markers that weren't around 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So for a long period of time, lipids played a very major role because they were seen as you know, biomarkers of cardiovascular risk. They were seen as pretty much the marker at some stage. But over time, technology's got better. We can look at more inflammatory markers, coagulation markers, transcription factors. All these different, you know, let's call them molecules for this example, play a much larger role as a um, complex entity rather than just as a single. However, um, if someone does have you know, purely elevated you know, cholesterol or lipid levels, that does have a fundamental role in the progression of a, um, of a patient's you know, cutting metabolic profile, but it may not have been the cause of it. I think what you mentioned at, right at the beginning there was a good old um, recap of Virchow's triad, that lamina flow yeah. issue. But, uh, but you know, like, I guess then it's up to what we do to upset that lamina flow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. And and the body, um, we all know the body is very reactive to the environment that it's in and also the environment that we're in, like with it's hot, cold, wet or dry, for example. And if the elements in the body are running perfectly, the body tends to run quite well. Um, I want you to go back to you know, this triad that, that you've mentioned as well, which, we're, which is what I was alluding to, which is great. Um, if platelets, are seen as a, sen- a sentinel. They're floating around the body. They have a seven to ten day lifespan, so they don't live long. They float around the body. The sentinel is looking for damage, looking for what's going on. And I want you to imagine that's what they're like, little satellites floating around. If there's any damage to the artery or the vascular system, it sets up a whole big reflex reaction to it, and then it lays down material and therefore it sort of heals and seals it, so to say. But when the blood has a high level of lipids and other factors in there as well, this process can be amplified, leading to you know, atherosclerosis or a clot itself or an occlusion in some cases where it's fully blocked. So the body has all these wonderful mechanisms in place where it's wanting to survive. It's wanting everything to be working properly. But sometimes it comes down to what we're doing to it, that that's when there's a problem. And if we have a typical you know, Western diet, um, Full of you know, carby carbs and chippy chips and you know, all the other wonderful Western foods, we're not actually helping the body system work effectively. But if we follow the more Mediterranean style diet of healthy fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds, good quality proteins, etc., we're allowing the body to metabolize and absorb all the nutrients effectively, leading to a better health within, which then leads to a better health outside. 
Brad, you mentioned hormonal dysregulation previously. Uh, what's the links here between uh, cardiometabolic syndrome and polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS? Uh, can you expand on this? And also, what about thyroid function? Um, very good questions, because there are um, big links between um, the three of these, actually. So uh, I want you to think um, hormones play a major role in our body, uh, as we know. And in the case of um, PCOS, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, there is a greater risk of um, insulin resistance because, remember, insulin is a hormone working in the body. And, again, this is where the body is not able to metabolise insulin effectively into the cells, leading to a resistant state. Um, glucose intolerance plays a major role as well, and this is all related to the stress response. Um, there's a number of animal studies and human studies that found that when um, animals or humans are under stress, they have an increased level of glucose in the blood, um, lipids in the blood, for example, and this is to give us that fight or flight response. So therefore, the body's ready to run away from the saber-toothed tiger, so to say, back in the old days. The world around us has changed, but the body still remains the same, the way how it works. So the response to the stressor is the same in the body as what it was thousands of years ago, yeah. and it will increase has as a glucose and lipids in the body to get you to fight or flight, to get you out of the way in some cases. And with the modern day stresses, I want you to imagine in the past our main stresses were physical. We'd be working on farms, as our grandparents told us, they worked, you know, walked six miles to school every day. <laughs> yeah. and like yeah, oh, that yeah, old yeah. chestnut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not doing that. Um, but you know, like there, there's a lot of things that you walked it off. You you burnt off that stress. Yeah. These days, a lot of our stress is related to sort of mental and emotional stress where it's held inside. It's more silent. We don't notice it. And it could be related to um, a work stress, a family stress, um, stress for friends. Like These are just classic basic things. You couldn't have an assignment due or a presentation or something else like this. And this can cause a bit of a stress response. But most of the time... I'll say to you, the body gets over it and the hormones and everything, neurotransmitters, et cetera, go back to normal. But in people who have longer stress levels, longer impact of stress, this does affect you know, areas of you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. So in, in males, it's like um, you know, infertility, erectile dysfunction, for example. In females, it's um, PCOS or PCOS. And in males and females, it can actually relate to thyroid function as well because I want you to think that the thyroid is like the energetic balancer in the body. It affects the various aspects of cardiometabolic syndrome. And it's, sort of, it's interesting to find that where I think of you know, thyroid as, as energy, as people are oh, I'm feeling tired, it could be low thyroid, that, that could be right. But I want you to see the biochemistry in the background the thyroid hormones are essential for, you know, the cellular energetic homeostasis, regulation of the body metabolic rate. So therefore, if the thyroid is under or over functioning, that can alter our energetic pathways or energetics in total. So this influences body weight. That if someone has a hypothyroid or low thyroid health condition, they have a typical increase in body weight. Um, there's also been associations with low thyroid function with elevated blood pressure readings, both systolic and diastolic. Um, there's also relationships between thyroid hormone, lipid parameters, fasting glucose levels. And one of the main things it does in the background thyroid hormones, it regulates insulin metabolism in the periphery. Mm. So not just you know, so the arms and legs like the rest of the body and metabolizes glucose handling. So that way we can actually energize our cells and our tissue more effectively. So thyroid hormones play a very major role there. It, it, it's very interesting that the body has a, uh, an interesting way to adapt to energy, that it will throw itself out of balance. Again, it's this fight or flight mechanism where in some cases it might start, let's just say, eating up available nutrients for thyroid hormone production, just tyrosine, selenium, zinc, copper, you know, the B vitamins, etc., yeah. which are also used to metabolize blood glucose levels and fatty acids in the body, not just the lipids. So the body starts to utilize and, let's just say, take nutrients from other metabolic processes. And this, again, goes back to the person's diet. The, the, you know, everything goes back to the diet. What I think is interesting, though, is that back in my day, 
Firstly, polycystic ovarian syndrome was rare. Maybe we were under-recognising it, certainly. Also, lower thyroid function. Those two conditions were classically attributed to higher weight, body mass, higher weight. The, the apple-shaped obesity was the classic PCOS um, body type. Um, the yeah. hypothyroid uh, patient was the person who had the sluggish metabolism, the um, um, myxedema, you know, that sort of textbook analogy, if you like. Um, but nowadays, they just don't fit now into the body type. So where should we be suspecting these issues? And, and these are very these are very interesting points because if you look at the classic picture, you know, low thyroid is seen as, oh, you're just tired or have chronic fatigue syndrome and PCOS is overweight. But like you've just said that, you know, you could be underweight with thyroid issues. Mm. You could be underweight with PCOS. And this is because of the individual variability and this is why it's taken a very long time to have these, you know, classifications written up for these health conditions. It's estimated that around about 20% of the female population has PCOS. And that's wow. quite a high number. So one in every five. And if you think about the um, whether it's the Western world, and they're also finding this um, always throughout Europe and Asia uh, and even African continents as well. So it's a widespread health condition. And I think only because it's been recognised now with greater sort of definitions and characteristics, we can actually see now that it's such a larger health issue. And some women have been suffering, let's just say, for 10 years with multiple chronic health conditions and didn't know what it was. They now finally have an answer that we can work with. So I've seen a broad range of patients with um, PCOS and thyroid disorders, and everyone's different. And that's one of the exciting things about what we do in um, natural medicine is everyone's different. So therefore, we can actually, you know, take the notes, work out the specific case issues. And I could have, you know, 10 females in a row coming in with um, multiple health conditions, for example. And there may be the two out of, you know, two out of 10 um, sort of coming through. And, um, you know, that, that, that's quite a lot of patients coming through at PCOS, but they'll all present differently. So that's what I'm liking about the, um, you know, there's more information in the news, magazines, newspapers, social media. There's so much more information on this health condition now that you know, females are turning around saying, oh, this could be it, and going in and you know, consulting a healthcare practitioner and finding out what's best for their health and how they can work with it. Oh, yeah, such a huge issue now. I think the, uh, the ATMS are holding their symposium this year because of it, because of that, in, of that exact subject. I need to ask you a question. Uh, and that is when people have a major stress usually a sad yes. stress, like a death of a loved one, and they can die of a broken heart. What is it? Um, well, wh one thing I'd like to say, we've always heard of someone you know, dying from a broken heart. So they've lost a loved one, a family member, a best friend. In some cases, they're um, dog or cat or mm. animal. Mm. You know, it's, it's quite serious because you have a lot of love you know, around it. Oh, absolutely. And um, so broken heart syndrome is real. You do hear about it. And it wasn't only up until recently um, we found out more information about it. Um, World-leading research has been conducted at the University of Sydney, which is, you know, I don't want to use the word fantastic, but it's good to have an actual understanding now what's happening. And what they found in bereaved people who had lost someone in the last month or last six months, 12 months, for example, that they pretty much most of them compared to healthy controls had increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased inflammation in the body, lots of thrombotic changes, so increased platelets and coagulation levels, higher cortisol levels because of stress, high stress markers, less sleep duration so they didn't sleep, so their recovery stage was a lot less. And quite a number of them suffered from depression and anxiety. So this is quite a, um, I'm going to say to you, a relatively new health condition that we've known since pretty much probably since the dawn of time. Um, it, it is very serious and um, it's very sad, but also at the same time, it shows that the connectivity people have with each other, as well as you know, with you know, the animals, for example. So yeah, it is um, it is real, so to say. So I've had people ask me that question: Is broken heart syndrome real? And the answer is yes, and it has a massive impact on the body. And my understanding is further research has been conducted at the University of Sydney, and now other universities around the world are looking into it as well because it's such a, 
massive issue. Mm. Yeah, the loss, loss of a loved one, of course. So I guess what, what the issue here is, you mentioned inflammation. Are certain people predisposed to this if they're already uh, inflamed or are, is it a genetic type thing? I'm going to say um, yes to both of those. So anyone that has um, inflammation, well, I should rephrase it, everyone has inflammation, but to certain levels. But when there's an elevation in um, yeah, thank you. inflammation in the body, it creates a bigger fire within, so to say. Mm. And um, like I think if you have multiple stressors leading up to a point, so let's just imagine um, they knew their partner was dying and this person, let's just say it was with cancer, they've had you know, a longer time knowing the end point is going to happen. This is building the body up over a long period of time, the stress markets. And then the person passes, which is a very emotional stress, and they've all lost someone. There's a very um, major emotional stress on the body, and that can lead to those symptoms I mentioned earlier. But in some cases, you might actually have a huge, very strong stress. Um, I knew of someone many, many years ago that um, you know they they had a loss of a of a loved one. Um, this person sort of went away on holidays and yeah, sort of didn't come back, so to say. So they didn't actually get to say, you know, fell well to their to their family member. So and and that and that's very sad. Um, so they had to go to that place and you know do do the normal process. But their body's response was was massive. They did have broken heart syndrome, and this person was in their early forties. So it's not like you know, you have to be old and frail, 80, 90, 100-year-old kind of person. You could be, let's just say, 20, 30s and 40s for this because it is such a huge impact on the body itself and the amount of changes it does is massive. Yeah, huge. Brad, your main focus with lecturing is on nutrition and you say that nutrition and diet are the foundations of all health and healing, which seems obvious, but you're also a fan of the art of clinical prescribing, which I think is an interesting term. Can you effectively blend the art and the science? The, the answer is yes. Um, this is a great question because it's something I love is um, you know, the art of clinical prescribing because we can always look at science and say, like we're just saying then, increased coagulation and mm. platelet function, everything else like that. But it's a, it's a matter of blending it all together. So there is definitely an art. So I want you to think back to what we are saying earlier, that everyone is different, everyone is unique. We have different family history, um, right, so there are different genetics. Um, it's also gender and age plays a major role, health status. So a lot of these things we take into play in our mind. The nutritional status, the overall diet and deficiencies of the person. And then the art of it becomes with a lot more of the science as well. It's the synergy of the nutrients. It's the absorption, the metabolism, the assimilation, the excretion, the storage of these things, and you know, how these interact within the body itself. And some of this has no scientific explanation as yet. Also, the emotional stress response that we're just saying. How does this impact? And I've got some of the science markers of you know, inflammation, oxidative stress, genetic polymorphisms like the um, you know, MTHFR that we've been seeing the last sort of 10, 20 years in clinical practice, and the biochemistry driving this all around. And this plays a very big role, particularly if people are taking medications or multiple medications. And the subsequent deficiencies, like um, you mentioned statins earlier, um, for example, a common deficiency there is coenzyme Q10 because it's found in the same pathway. Um, another area we look at is previous response and adherence to treatment and how that went. Why did they continue treatment? Um, why did they stop treatment? Was there any breaks in it? So we're bringing the person back in. And it's like the overall factor behind or driving all this is the vital force. Now, I remember the first time I learned about vital force was from Star Wars. Um, and I've told this story a number of times before. Yeah. So, yeah, you're on the Millennium Falcon and you've got Obi-Wan Kenobi talking about, you know, the forces all around us. It's in all living things and surrounds us and everything else. Um, and it sort of made me start thinking that there is a vital force because something's driving everyone, drives the earth. Like, like we can go really deep with this yeah. kind of thing. And it's a matter of, you know, blending it all together. And a lot of it also is related to observation. I do a lot of, you know, face, tongue, nail diagnosis. Um, you know, you talk with the person, you sit down with them and go through their health status in detail, for example. 
and you're sort of you're piecing and putting everything together. And I think there is an art to the overall effect of what we do in clinical practice. Um, and whether we're prescribing for an allergy, for example, like an acute case or a chronic long-term health condition, and, and this patient may have seen you, let's just say, 10 times for their health conditions or once, it's still an art to piecing and putting it all together. And that's sort of where I use timelines and mind maps and sort of, you know, piecing and putting it all together because there is a big art to actually sitting down and working out, okay, what's happening with this person in front of us? What has happened in the past? And if they continue on the same, you know, trail, um, do they continue the same way? So if they keep eating a Western diet, for example, will their health condition get worse? And, of course, we know that, yes. So there is definitely an art to what we do. You and I have spoken previously about timelines and mind maps playing a major role in your prescribing. How Can you explain this to our listeners, please? Yeah, no worries. Um, timelines and mind maps is something I've been doing since the beginning of my career. I want you to imagine that timelines are used for the history of the patient to investigate the causes, correlations, associations. And these are like linear. So it could be from, you know, from their teenage years, it could be from their 20s, 30s, 40s, etc. And some people may have been from birth because they've been never well since due to a traumatic birth process. So timelines are used for piecing and putting everything together. Um, my maps are very useful for putting all the pieces together, both present, previous long-term health conditions, in a more complex manner. So there are little clouds on your page or in your mind and you're, you're mapping, you're building and putting everything together. So I want you to imagine that timelines and mind maps are seen as peeling back the layers. You have the person sitting in front of you, they're telling you their story and their story could be cut in metabolic disease, PCOS, thyroid, and you're actually pulling and piecing everything together and peeling it back to find out what is the origin, what are the drivers of this person's health condition. Mm, mm. And that's where you know, this plays a major role. So you can actually use it to analyse, you know, even treatment responses and the time taken to heal. So they may have seen other health practitioners in the past. Um, so you can actually track to see how that worked. It's very good for tracking current treatment, suggesting progress based on the previous history, and um, expected outcomes. And reassessment. And reassessment, definitely. And that's what I was about to mention next. So that one of the best things about using timelines and mind maps is that could be used for reassessment. So I tend to work in phases or stages, so to say. So phase one is laying down the foundations. So you lay down the foundations, and that could be just basic dietary changes with the first appointment, for example. Then they come back, we review how they're going. If there's progress and everything is moving on quite fine, we move on to the next phase of healing. Let's just say there's been little progress um, or no progress in some cases. We review, we modify to suit the current health goals that the person now has. Because yep. sometimes, you know, people get better in two weeks because of such a, let's just say, a basic health condition like a cold or flu kind of thing. And other things take much longer. And then that's where the phases work. So it's a continual, you know, review, manage, review, manage, progress. And that's what I like about using timelines is they're, they're not static. You can actually build upon something from the past and work forward onto the next. And it's not like you can predict the future, but you can actually say the first person keeps tracking the way they are, their energy levels today are 5 out of 10, could actually be a 7 out of 10 in a number of weeks' time because two weeks ago they were a 4, now they're a 5, and if they keep doing it the way how they're going, it actually builds upon the foundations. And it's a very good tracking and review process. And as I said, I've used this from the beginning of my career and I find it very useful. I like the way that you always use these. Um, I, I know that sometimes there's a subjective part to um, how people are getting better, how their progress is being uh, seen, but you always like to put it in a numbered format or, or some sort of definitive, objectified format so that you can say, well, before they were a two, now they're four, seven. So you know, not just quote unquote, they're getting better, but you know how much better they're getting, even if it might be a, of a subjective nature. That, that's right. And sometimes patients forget. They might come back and say, oh, nothing's changed. We don't feel any better. And you can say, well, how's your energy levels today? Yeah. And they can say it's a seven. And you say, well, last time right. you said it was a five and the week or two weeks before that you said it was a four. Right. So sometimes patients, you know, forget things that aren't there anymore. 
So then they move on to the next thing. So it's, it's also a good thing for, for tracking, but also to show the patient, like what you're saying, you can show them that they are improving. And a lot of the time I use this in something basic called Excel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I put it into Excel and use graphs and lines and all those kind of things because they can actually see it in a line graph and it makes it look much easier for them rather than just numbers. Yeah. I use numbers and lines. What about compliance issues here, Brad? Um, so, you know, there's no progress. Do you revisit your timelines and your mind maps and say, okay, I'm on the wrong focus here and you have to really get them on board? Um, for instance, uh, Dr. Andrew Heyman, one of the great things he says is people, patients get really frustrated with me saying, on the scale of one to 10, how likely are you to? And so he always gets them to basically opt into a contract and say, what are you going to do here? So what are your well, that's strategies? That's right. Um, well, my, my strategies are that um, very similar. I, I use the zero to 10 scale mm-hmm. and because um, that way zero is no change, for example, or zero stress or zero energy um, as an example. So um, I use it as a strategy for compliance because that way when you track it over time, you can see, well, this person's energy levels or stress levels changed yeah, two months ago. What happened? Oh, they missed their appointment. There was an extra stress. They were on a holiday. They had a work project due. Um, there may be a student studying, going into exams or something else like that. Yeah. So this is a good way to actually track compliance. And then you can actually turn around and say, okay, that person's health didn't go according to what we worked out a plan together because of these external influences. They may have left their... um you know, supplement, for example, at work on the Friday and they didn't get back to it on the Monday. So there's, you know, two days worth of a time point. And that could be enough for some people to actually make a difference in their health status, missing something for two days. Or they've gone on holidays and left it behind. So this is a good way to track. Yeah, it can also um, make a difference in habit forming because if you, like I've done this even with medicines, you know, you forget a medicine um, for one day, two days, and then the habit of taking it is gone. And, and I'm glad you brought up medicine because I forgot to mention that earlier, that these mind maps and timelines can be used for medicine as well mm. and for surgeries and any other health aspect. So let's just say someone does have um, high blood pressure, they're on a medication for that, and their blood pressure is coming down over time, as it hopefully should be with the yeah. medication yeah. and diet and lifestyle factors. Yeah. Um, we can then chart that more effectively. And when they go back to their GP, for example, and get a review, the GP might change the dose of the medication or the the frequency, et cetera, or the medication itself might change. We can also track that along with what we do with um, vitamins, minerals, herbal medicines, and dietary changes, for example. And it comes back to that point that I mentioned earlier, synergy, that a lot of these things work together. And if you get the right match, this is again the art of it, if you get the right match, the person's health improves quite dramatically. And that's why I also love timelines. Yeah. This is piecing and putting everything together. Getting back to therapy here, what are there any specific foods that people should definitely be eating to reduce their risk of cardiometabolic syndrome? And I'm going to weave in your favourite food, chocolate. What about chocolate? <laughs> One thing to remember is that diet has a very big impact on our health and particularly for negative health as well. So if you think about it, I'll answer your, uh, I'll go from this from the the negative point of view first, yeah. so then we can build upon that. If you maintain a purely westernized diet, and there's a lot of research on this of red and processed meats, sweets, desserts, potatoes, you know, the high carbohydrate, high glycemic foods, refined grains, high amounts of sugar and saturated fats, for example, and even trans fats, you had a higher risk of cardiometabolic syndrome and lots of chronic diseases. Some of these include, you know, type two diabetes, insulin resistance obesity, fatty liver diseases, etc. But if you follow a diet that's more related to the Mediterranean diet or the paleo or paleolithic diet, and these are diets higher in vegetables and green leafy vegetables, fruits, vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables, potassium fiber, you know, tree nuts, particularly walnuts. Um, in the olden days, like in the past, it was more cacao, you know, bean itself rather than chocolate. So it's been used for millennia. Um, polyunsaturated fatty acids such as omega-3. Even avocado has a lot of good research coming through now um, showing the health benefits of the yeah. good quality fats and nutrients in avocado. So I think if you look at the um, you know, overall diet, I want you to think of it as 
you know, laying down the foundations. And this is what I, I tend to say, it's, you know, my main focus on nutrition is sort of laying down the foundations of all health and well-being. So if you put good quality foods in, you're more likely going to get good quality foods out. Um, there's a very odd saying that your body is a temple, and I do truly believe this, that if if you want the body to reach its full potential, you need the wrong foundations. And these include you know, high-quality foods. You know, blueberries, for example, these are very specific foods for good quality health. There's a lot of research coming out of Harvard, for example, Harvard University. Um, turmeric, um, because it pretty much does, it does everything, doesn't it? Turmeric um, is a favourite. A lot of people, you can have it as a spice every day in stir fries, turmeric lattes, turmeric supplements. Um, I have, um, you know, a lot of pres- prescriptions where I just do turmeric with food for people, just mm. to have it every mm. day. Absolutely. Um, garlic and onions for the sulfur components, detoxification of the body, but also these nutrients are very high in zinc and selenium and other nutrients for, you know, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory immune status. Um, green tea, for example. Green tea is very good. It's antioxidant, but it's also fluid. We're increasing our fluid because a lot of us don't drink enough water or fluids during the day. Flax seeds, chia seeds, um, nuts, particularly walnuts. And again, I'd like to emphasize, you know, having smashed avo on toast is okay. Um, I just don't advise it every day. Um, so you also prescribe timeouts to people. Can you tell us more about this? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, timeouts, it, it's, it's quite interesting that um, we always need that timeout. And there's, you, know, you go for a walk, you know, find a hobby, go to the beach. It's We all need that timeout from whatever we're doing. And whether it's... Um, work or study or any kind of intensity, we actually do need you know, time out. And you know, I always say to people, you know, what do you love doing? And they'll say to me, I love reading a book, for example. I'll go, well, how often do you do that? And sometimes it makes people think that they actually aren't doing it as much as possible. Yeah. So it, it's quite interesting that, um, you know, we say we love doing these things, but we don't have the time to actually do them. So I say to people, set aside 10 minutes, have a time out for you in this case, read a book, sit outside, go for a walk, meditate, um, do some yoga or anything else for yourself yeah. and have that time out. And that could be once a day, two to five times a day. It doesn't matter how many times a day it is. It's because it's you wanting to do it and you feeling comfortable doing it. And, and that's the main point. So some period of mindfulness, whatever that, that um, activity is. That's right. What would be your top 10 for managing and treating cardiometabolic syndrome? Oh, I start with diet as foundation. So I'm looking at Mediterranean-style diet, high fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds. And in recent years, there's been a big push sort of um, in the media and in clinical practice of the paleo diet, so the paleolithic diet. That plays a very big role as well. So I'm happy for people to subscribe to Mediterranean-style diet. Omega-3, polyunsaturated fatty acids, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, cell membrane, you know, cell signaling pathways. It does so much in the body that we're still learning about. And, you know, and of course, omega-3 can be taken in all different ages. Mm. That's the exciting thing about omega-3. And I, I recommend you know, several thousand milligrams per day of that. Magnesium, you know, again, antioxidant, vasodilator. It's a very useful nutrient, particularly magnesium orotate in cardiometabolic disorders or disease or syndrome. It works very well. Again, vasodilator, blood coagulation. Blueberries play a very big role in my clinical practice because they're just such good food that you can add any time you can add into your smoothie, into, you know, muesli or just eat as they are. Packed full of nutrients and antioxidants. And again, there's a lot of research coming out of um, Harvard University at the moment, the benefits of blueberries. Mm-hmm. Walnuts, we've already sort of talked about. There's so much research with walnuts yep. now. It's unbelievable what it Still does. Old. It covers all the metabolic profiles, including PCOS and thyroid disorder. But one thing I'd like to note about nuts I didn't mention earlier, um, there's always been concern about the fat content of nuts and that it increases weight or weight circumference, or waist circumference, I should say. And um, There's a lot of research coming out the last 10 years now that shows that walnuts and other nuts actually reduce mm. you know, BMI as well as waist circumference. It's actually very good in cutting metabolic conditions. Add some spice to your life. You have some turmeric and cinnamon. Drink more water. You know, preferably filtered or purified. 
And again, yeah, avoid sugar, trans fatty acids, artificial colors, flavors, sweeteners, preservatives, processed foods, refined foods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, number nine would be my time out, you know, mindfulness, stress management. Number 10 is increased physical activity. Go for a walk, get outside, go to the beach, sit there and ponder, combining that with time out. Um, as an extra bonus, because you've asked 10, the bonus is chocolate. I do believe I have to get it in but there. But particular chocolate. Um, um, high cacao chocolate. Uh, I don't want to mention any brands, but there's a lot of good brands in Australia yeah. and, and overseas that are high quality chocolate. Um, look for um, sort of 60% and above. Um, that's normally good. A lot of people go for the 70 to 80% cacao. And also, I'll make note now, check the spelling. It should be C A C A O. If they change the letters around, it tends to have more sugar in it, like cocoa versus cacao. Yeah, that's right. And, 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 and the other part to that is um, ethically managed as well. It's a very huge issue. They reckon um, in the next 20 years, we're going to run out of vanilla and chocolate, as in the cacao itself, because the amount of consumption of 7 billion people on the planet. Mm. So there's always worried about that. So a lot of um, companies in Australia use sustainable um, you know, forestry practices, etc., and they're looking after the environment. So I really support Australian companies in chocolate. And the extra bonus is, of course, you know, having a bit of red wine every now and then. Yeah. Sitting back, relaxing, have a bit of red wine, because, again, it's high quality and um, you know, good for you with Mediterranean study. Brad, thank you so much for taking us through. I mean, this is, this is not just an hour odd. Uh, podcast, of course. This is a huge issue which requires true learning and, and true expertise to disseminate the many factors of this. So, But I, I thank you so much for taking us through some of the more important facets of cardiometabolic syndrome today. Thank you very much, Andrew. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. What if you could hang out in an epic location with an awesome, like-minded practitioner tribe? Having extraordinary experiences with a community of leaders, innovators and visionaries all sharing their wisdom to move our profession forward. It all starts with the Naturpreneur Experience, a professional development conference like no other for naturopaths, nutritionists, herbalists and practitioners. Check out NatX2019 at tammyguest.com for more details.